Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for our 55th episode of This is CDR. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by OpenAir to explore the range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals OpenAir seeks to advance at every level of government here in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on policy advocacy and market development for Open Air. Um, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, again, it's really great to have you here with us today. Um, quick background on Open Air. If you are not familiar with us, we're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions that are essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, we're a global community, and we work together on shared open source missions, member driven in the areas of research and development, messaging and communication communications, policy advocacy, and activist market development. Um, there should be a link in the chat to a form where you can um, uh, that you can fill out to join our group. Um, we're completely open source, as we say. We're very pleased to have you. There are tons of great projects to work on, and you can start your own project. So um, please uh, take a look, and if you're not already on our, on our platform, um, please join us. Before we get started with the program, um, we always try to provide a little bit of uh, uh, context uh, definitionally when we talk about carbon removal. This definition here is from the CDR primer, which is a great resource to learn about carbon removal. Um, it's additionally the same definition essentially that the IPCC uses in its reporting. Um, carbon removal is purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long duration products. Um, two important things to note when we talk about carbon removal. Number one, um, carbon removal is distinct from what's commonly referred to as carbon capture, which typically means point source carbon capture, capturing CO2 from an emission source, whether it's a natural gas power plant or a cement plant. Um, this may or may not be a, a beneficial climate solution, depending on the situation, the context, the socioeconomic and technoeconomic context. But one thing it's not is carbon removal, which again is removing CO2 from the atmosphere and durably storing it. Number two, when we talk about carbon removal, it's essential to call out that carbon removal is in no way, shape, or form any sort of substitute for reducing emissions. Um, we need to reduce emissions and decarbonize our global economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, there's clear scientific consensus uh, expressed most recently in, in the IPCC AR6 Working Group 3 report that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale, that's billions of tons per year by mid-century if we have want to have any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, the reason for that is there are certain emissions that we're just not going to be able to eliminate in a climate-relevant time frame. A great example is agriculture. Um, people need to eat. We need to feed the uh, you know a growing human population. And it, what's a third of global emissions come from our food sector, food, food production, food systems, and we're just not going to be able to eliminate those in the climate relevant time frame. Um, so for that reason, we are going to need carbon removal. Additionally, we have trillions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere. And as we can see, our climate is continuing to get worse. So in the second half of the century, we're going to need to remove some of that CO2 from the atmosphere to restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. So again, uh, gigaton scale carbon removal will be essential um, uh, by mid-century. We're currently at kiloton scale, so it's really important that we start working on it now. And carbon removal is an essential climate solution alongside reducing emissions, which we really need to prioritize. And additionally, we need to be able to adapt to the already changing climate. So emissions reductions, carbon removal, and adaptation are three essential climate solutions. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega Raghavan, who is going to talk a little bit about run of show, and she will introduce uh, today's exciting presenter. Hey everyone, I'm Mega. I am an Open Air member in London and I work on uh, policy advocacy as well. Um, so quick housekeeping notes, our format will be a short presentation followed by a few prepared questions and then we'll have a uh, moderated audience Q&A. So as we go along, please type any questions you have into the Q&A box. Um, it's separate from the chat, so make sure you find the right one. So it helps us to organize that a bit better. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it to OpenAir's uh, website and to our YouTube channel. Um, this week, we're very pleased to welcome Neustadt co-founder and co-CEO Johannes Tiefenthaler, who will tell us about his company's innovative method of durably sequestering biogenic CO2 in recycled concrete aggregate. 
Johannes Tipitala holds a PhD from ETH Zurich, where he developed the next generation of technology for the mineralization of carbon dioxide. Having co-founded Neuschak, he manages the company together with his co-founder, uh, Valentin Gudnet, and is responsible for technology and scientific affairs. Uh, so Johannes, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thanks a lot, Mega, for this introduction, and I start sharing the screen. Yeah, a Let's warm think. welcome from my side. Can you hear me? And can you see? Yeah, we can hear and see. Okay, very good. So a warm welcome from my side. My, my name is Johannes Stiefendahl from uh, co-CEO from Neustark. And at Neustark, we enable permanent carbon storage by actually fixing biogenic CO2 in the motion concrete. And in the upcoming 20 minutes, I want to give you uh, a deep insight in what we are actually doing. So um, the uh, clear motivation behind what we are doing is, is global climate change. And for reducing emissions, one key technology is actually carbon capture and storage. And this is a key technology to decarbonize the industry. And for that, we need uh, permanent storage solutions. And on, and on the other hand, we also have to actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it permanently. And for that, we also need um, storage solutions. So that's the yellow part. And the other part is probably this part, which has to be uh, fixed uh, from emissions of the industry. This is uh, the clear motivation and to uh, point it, uh, to show it uh, once more. So um, we need storage solutions at the one hand to actually avoid emissions from, for instance, cement manufacturing process, which is an industrial process, which is also going to be in place uh, 2050 onwards, where we cannot emit CO2 anymore. And there we basically need to fix this CO2 such that it does not um, enter the atmosphere. But on the other hand, we need to remove emissions from the atmosphere. So basically a ton of CO2, which is still emitted in 2050 to the atmosphere, has to be removed and stored permanently to reach net zero emissions. So what are the different approaches actually towards carbon dioxide removal? On the one hand, there are nature-based solutions where the CO2 is taken out from the atmosphere and then um, stored in the biomass or actually the lifetime of the biomass. Then there are hybrid solutions where the CO2 is taken out of the atmosphere, stored in the biomass, and then this biomass is somehow uh, processed in a way that the carbon, uh, for instance, it's processed to energy, and then the uh, carbon is, is uh, captured and stored permanently, for instance, geologically. And the third approach is a, a pure technological approach, where, for instance, direct air capture, where C2 is removed through um, through a separation process from the air or from the ocean, and also stored permanently. And the, the message is clear, we, we are going to need uh, carbon dioxide removal solutions in the gigaton scale. So we're going to need all of these approaches. And I would say each of these approaches has certain advantages. So while the advantage of the nature-based approach is that it may help restoring, I would say the nature at the one hand, and it's uh, today available, the clear disadvantages, uh, the permanence, while if we go in this direction, the permanence increasing, for instance, the hybrid solution, has, would say, the benefit of being uh, permanent, but it comes at a higher cost uh, point. And then the technology-based solutions, they mostly have the advantage of, I would say, a relatively small uh, uh, footprint. Um, um, but of course, they come at, a, at an even higher cost. And no, at Neustadt, we, we focus on, on these type of solutions, on hybrid solutions, where we believe that this is kind of the, I would say, the golden, the, the golden middle. So at Neustadt, we develop our carbon dioxide removal technology in the concrete demolition sector. And demolition concrete, what you can see here at the left, is a waste stream which, um, which actually uh, comes with the demolition of buildings. So uh, concrete structures are, are um, would say, broken into these big chunks and then brought to concrete recycling plants, where it's afterwards broken into concrete aggregate. And that's the product here at the right side. Important to notice that this is actually the biggest waste stream on the planet in the 
say in the, the gigaton range, and it's going to grow um, according to the global uh, concrete uh, production. This is number one, and then it has the capability to fix 50 to 60 kilograms of CO2 per ton. So basically the process emissions of cement manufacturing. And the third thing is that this material stream is already today uh, recycled in the concrete recycling industry, which means that there is already an industry in place which pre-treats the material such that it's an ideal uh, precursor material for uh, carbon sequestration. So here you can see the value chain, the concrete recycling value chain, which is already in place. So this demolition concrete is collected at concrete recycling plants, broken into concrete aggregate, and this concrete aggregate then replaces conventionally primary aggregate and sand in construction activities, for instance, roads or buildings. Uh, in addition to that, we, base, or we basically added an additional value chain to this existing value chain, where the first step, we install our CO2 storage technology at the concrete recycler, and then uh, we built a CO2 supply chain where we go, for instance, to biogas upgrading plants, we liquefy the CO2 for the purpose of transporting it uh, to the concrete recycler, and there we apply our very simple patented technology where this concrete aggregate is basically contacted in an existing uh, reactor with CO2 at ambient pressure, ambient temperature. And this CO2 here undergoes a chemical reaction with the concrete aggregate, especially with the cement phases, and it forms calcium carbonate. So this CO2 is chemically transformed to calcium carbonate, and calcium carbonate is known as one of the, as the most permanent form of uh, storing CO2. So it usually maintains this form for geological times, unless it's heated to more than 600 degrees. Um, after we have stored the CO2, the next important step comes that we actually measure very precisely how much CO2 has been stored. And we subtract the process emissions along this value chain. So basically the emissions for supplying the CO2 and for fixing the, the CO2 at the one side, the energy related emissions, but also the material related emissions. And the net, climate impact gives basically a carbon dioxide removal certificate. And this is only proof that a certain amount of CO2 has been removed from the atmosphere. And in the next step, this credit is sold either to a, a, a customer, like for instance, uh, UBS, which uh, compensates their non-avoidable emissions with, with high quality carbon dioxide removal certificates, or in as an alternative route, which happens a lot in Switzerland, is that this credit is attached to the construction material and the builder pays premium. And the income uh, from the builder or the certificate customer is actually redistributed along uh, this value chain such that everyone can cover their cost and makes a small and earns a small uh, margin. And would say our value proposition is, of course, the storage part, but at the other side, setting up and operating uh, the overall value chain as well as bring the revenue stream in through the contact to the uh, to the certificate customers. So if we now look at the solution, how it's done today, you can see here a typical C2 source. This is a biogas plant. Uh, you can see here the basic the, the biogas is about 40% C2, 60% methane. And what they do quite often in Switzerland, they take out the CO2 to upgrade it to a natural gas quality. And this happens here in this uh, absorber. And then in the stripper, they need to get rid of the CO2. And we take the CO2, uh, which exits here and liquefy it. And then we transport it in these vessels to our concrete recyclers in the vicinity. So here you can see one side, the liquefaction. We use container-based liquefactions. And then we bring it to our storage plants where you can see here two, three typical storage plants. The first one is a row dosing unit, which is basically filled with a conveyor belt. Then this row doser is closed. And then we check CO2 uh, for a certain period of time. The CO2 is, uh, is fixed and afterwards the material is discharged. Another option is a silo system, which you can see here. 
uh, where there is uh, these basic big silo buildings where the material is stored before it's dosed into concrete or loaded on a truck. <clears throat> While the material is running through, we basically treat it with C2, which comes here from the tank. Uh, then it goes through the reboiler and uh, through the pipe and is injected into the concrete aggregate. And the third op option is basically these uh, boxes where the material is filled in with a wheel loader. You can treat about uh, 1,000 tons at a time. Then we check CO2, for instance, overnight. And then in the next day, they can load it on trucks and bring it to the construction site. So these are all commercially operating systems uh, in Switzerland. So how, uh, how does it, or where do we actually operate? So if we look at the left side, you can see the basically these orange uh, points they indicate storage plants, which are either in operation or currently under construction, that's Switzerland. Um, and what's very important is that basically in every urban area, you do not only need the CO2 sink, so the storage plant, but also the CO2 source. And that's the black ones, which are already under contract. The CO2 source is under contracts. And, uh, and what we are doing is that we're building basically, a, a, I would say, a network of sources and sinks, and we manage these capacities. And you can see that I mean, these are the projects which are, I would say, commercially operating, but then we have these blue signs, and these are all projects under development, um, under development in Switzerland. And this is, I would say, only Switzerland, where currently about 40 projects are under development. Moreover, we are also looking into uh, into Europe um, for next year. And there we expect that there are projects starting up actually in the Netherlands, then two projects in Germany. So this is Berlin, uh, one project probably in Paris and, and Austria is also where we are just about um, uh, signing contracts. So if we look a bit close at the technology, what we do is that we can actually measure the CO2 uptake either by a, a mass balance over the gas phase, or we can also just put the whole material on scales and measure the weight increase. And we did this with the same batch. And you can see from one container, these two measurements, they are perfectly overlapping, uh, showing that, I mean, these are, of course, two valid approaches. And that's also the typical shape of CO2 uptake. There is a very steep increase initially, dominated by the C2 injection rate. And afterwards, the reactivity of the material goes down over time. And time and then the C2 uptake rate also goes down. Then a more qualitative um, method to actually see what happened is to take an electron microscope and look at the surface of these particles. And here you can see the typical um, hydrated cement phases or amorphous structures. Then if you look very precisely at the treated surface, you can see that there are these uh, cuboidal crystalline structures and that it's the typical shape of calcite, one form of uh, calcium carbonate. So we can actually say that something happened that calcium carbonate formed. Moreover, so far we only have looked at the storage component, but what we have to consider is that this material is afterwards used either in road construction or in concrete. Road construction is, would say, not that critical because there it's mainly about the shape of the material that we don't touch. But for concrete, um, we actually have to check whether we can replace um, recycled concrete aggregate, which has not been treated, uh, or whether we have any downstream uh, implications on concrete. So we basically did a, a concrete test. You can see here the typical concrete test, which is a mixed design with 40% concrete aggregate. That's the reference, which is used today. You can see the orange part is the Sorry, the black part is the compressive strength, so basically the design parameter. What we did afterwards is that we batched exactly the same mixed design, but now we carbonated the concrete aggregate, and then we obtained this mixed design. And you can see that the compressive strength, which is the design parameter increased, which is a very good sign. That's, I mean, actually good. So what we could do in these tests is that we could actually reduce the cement amount by about 10%. And then this is this mixed design and we still uh, meet, would say a similar performance as the reference mixed design. And this clearly shows that we, there is, we, we, we can not even, we would say we cannot even 
keep the performance, but we can even re, re, improve the performance and avoid additional emissions. And we could also confirm that at industrial scale. Very important for us to mention is that basically these avoided emissions, that's the upside of the concrete plant. So we don't account for this additional avoided emissions in our framework because these are avoided emissions actually not removed emissions and uh, the construction shy is the, I would say the planner should actually benefit from these avoided emissions. And of course, would say these are the hard facts, but then there are the soft facts like the workability of the concrete, like how the guys at the construction site like this material and we figured out that they actually don't uh, feel a difference if they don't know. So um, <clears throat> moreover, one key aspect of every carbon dioxide removal technology is to understand, I would say, the whole ecosystem at the one side and also do a, a proper life cycle assessment. And we did that. Here you can see the typical, uh, const would say, concrete production landscape where at the end of the use phase of a building, it's dismantled and enters the concrete recycling plant where it's basically crushed and then conventionally it's mixed with cement and water to give new concrete and it ends up at the recycling plant. And the, what we add is basically the mineralization part, which is this part. And what's also part of the today's landscape is basically a biogas upgrading. So the biogenic waste is treated, biogas is produced, methane is produced, the CO2 is discharged. So the additional steps we actually add to this landscape are these four steps. So the CO2 supply, which is liquefaction, transport, evaporation, and then the mineralization. Everything else does not change. So basically, I would say this is the baseline. And we have to account for the emissions and the emission reductions within the, this baseline to actually quantify the net climate impact. In our case, this is the uh, the, the net uh, CDR volumes. And we did that. So here you can see basically for this value chain of liquefaction, transport, evaporation, mineralization, that each of these steps needs at the one side energy. So here you can see, for instance, electricity, but also materials. And all these, and the energy and materials, they come with associated greenhouse gas emissions for which we have to account. So one example is that, of course, for the transport, we should not, on, we do not only have to account for the fuel which is used, but we also need to account for the for the vehicle which is built, also for the roads, which have to be renewed every, don't know, 50 years in order to enable the transport. So this is all accounted for in actually the life cycle inventory. Okay, we we um, we actually did the case for a, a typical value chain, which is the, the cluster of Bern, so which is the capital city of, of Switzerland. So evaluating this, <clears throat> this data set <clears throat> um, ends up getting such, uh, such plots. Here you can see the global warming uh, potential gram C2 equivalent uh, for the liquefaction, transport, evaporation, and mineralization. And one can see that the electricity is the main emission driver and the liquefaction as well. The transport distance, which is this part, has only a minor impact, transport distance of C2. And then um, there is, of course, the evaporation and the mineralization. And if we sum up these impacts, we end up at having about 60 kilograms of CO2 emissions while we fix one ton of CO2. So we talk about the carbon dioxide removal efficiency of about 94%. And if so, I want to put this in perspective. This, is of course, is Swiss case um, using the Swiss grid. If we go, for instance, so this is. The point here, if we now go, for instance, to another country like to the, uh, to the European Union on average, the removal um, efficiency would drop about to 85% and would say uh, also a good example is Germany where a lot of the electricity is produced from coal. And there we still have an efficiency which is in the range of 75 to 80%, although we could use coal fired uh, electricity. Say, so what we can see is that the sensitivity towards the electricity mix is very high, but it's still a valid climate solution, even in, let's say, the worst case. Um, the transport distance of the CO2, on the other hand, is not that significant. So there we realize that 
for people, that's an, a very emotional factor. But if you actually look at the impact, we can bring the C2 for, let's say, 300 kilometers and the, and the impact is minor. So we lose a bit in efficiency. We actually don't use a diesel truck. We use a biogas power truck, which even reduces the impact. So I would say this is kind of the scientific part, the life cycle assessment, but this exact was actually then translated into a, a gold standard, a certified removal method methodology. And this is, it. and we developed together with gold standard, actually the first uh, uh, tech-based carbon removal uh, methodology. Um, and what, and that's also something we are very proud about. And, uh, we are going to issue the first credits uh, actually now according to this methodology for the year um, 2022 and this um, <clears throat> this step is very important because a negative emission is something which you cannot see you cannot feel it and for this reason you need to transform this into a trusted product and uh, and carbon standards allow us to uh, transform it into a trusted product so this is would say a vital step for every business in this space. So moreover, we would say we have another type of uh, customer and these are actually construction projects. And here, so what, what happens with the construction material is, especially with the concrete, that it quite often ends up um, at, uh, would say, big construction sites. And there is now a customer base in Zurich which requests concrete which stores CO2. And here you can see a big construction project in the canton of Zug, uh, where the company holds him. It's actually a multinational company, biggest salmon producer on the planet. Um, they, um, they build a building with a few thousand uh, cubic meters of uh, concrete, which actually stores CO2. And this is, this is very much a momentum. So um, this is not only a single project, but also the public procurement here in Zurich is currently on the way to, to make it a standard CO2 sequestering uh, concrete and the, the public transport of the city of Zurich, which is also publicly owned. They, they're only going to purchase this, this uh, concrete for the upcoming um, years. And this gives, of course, the whole industry a lot of uh, momentum. And by saying that, um, I want to mention maybe a few words about uh, Neustadt itself. So we were founded in 2019. We are now um, basically uh, three years on the road. And in the meanwhile, we are uh, 25 people working on uh, two locations in Zurich and in Bern, headquarters in Bern. And our aim is to, um, to, reach, a, uh, to reach an operating uh, carbon removal capacity of 1 million tons in 2030 in demolishing concrete. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Johannes, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I think we particularly appreciate the detail that you um, shared in terms of your life cycle analysis and the techno-economics of your project, which is uh, <clears throat> really great to see. Um, we always start out with kind of a, a little bit of a softball first question, but we'd love to hear a little bit about your personal journey to where you are and, and how you got interested in carbon removal and how specifically you and, and Valentin got together to start the company. Um, could you share a few words on that? Yes, of course. So actually the whole journey started during my studies at the at ETH Zurich. ETH Zurich is the technical university here. Uh, and I was taking a lecture in in on carbon uh, carbon capture and storage um, and uh, there it was made clear that we need storage solutions um, actually for the capture co2 for to generate negative emissions or to decarbonize industrial processes but if and, and this was was a few years ago i don't know six six years ago and if i looked around there was i mean it was clear that we needed but nothing was was happening and would say this was uh, this was uh, motivating me very much to actually um, let's say um, start something and and let it happen and I realized that there is actually a lab which does research on CO two mineralization in this space and CO two mineralization is would say in 
Europe something which is very attractive because there's a big opposition against geological uh, storage, especially in, in Central Europe, I would say for on for um, onshore geological uh, sequestration. So um, what I did is I did a master thesis and then also doctoral studies in this laboratory with the aim to develop uh, technologies which can be commercialized in order to generate climate impact. And on that pathway, I, um, I met Valentin who was, I would say by chance, working very much on the same topic, but not from a technological side, but he tried to, uh, to understand whether one can make a business out of sequestering C2 in motion concrete. And um, let's say um, yeah, it was kind of a, a perfect timing and we joined forces and uh, here we are. Fantastic. Um, you referenced a couple of the players in this sort of Swiss uh, carbon removal ecosystem, um, but we, we've had Climeworks on, and obviously there's quite a bit going on both in academia and research institutions as well as commercially in Switzerland. Can you just talk about Switzerland as a as a ecosystem for carbon removal and how it the pros and cons and what's good? You know, how, how has it helped you being based in Switzerland to get new Neustark off the ground? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think um, if we look at, so there are two, basically two technical universities in, in Switzerland, and I would say they're they are very research focused and they also have a very good resource base. And I think there of course happens uh, quite a lot, but on the other hand, I think the public sector also plays a key role. So if you look at the Swiss climate strategy, I would say uh, negative emissions are well acknowledged, which means that um, that about 10% of the today's emissions should be addressed with carbon removal technologies. And I would say that's clearly a, an achievement made by Neustadt and by Climeworks to, to point it out that that's uh, possible. And in addition, the, the companies which are moving fast in this space are waste incineration companies next to cement plants, which also know clearly that uh, this is the only way and they are publicly owned. So I think they, they really uh, play a pioneering role. And in addition, what we can see in the, pub, in the, in the private sector is that um, companies, let's say recycling companies, they see that as a big opportunity actually to, um, um, to make the, to decarbonize the products and to, um, uh, yeah, they, they see it as a competitive advantage they can gain by uh, participating uh, in this environment and they see themselves as part of the solution. And I think um, all these uh, components in, let's say, this small playground of Switzerland, they play quite well together, but we are also convinced that uh, I mean, we, we can cross the borders. We are not afraid of that. Good. Well, I'm going to ask you about that in just a second. Um, when you can you just say re-explain what you mean when you say biogenic CO2, just to make sure that the audience understands what you're using for your feedstock. And are you do you use any other potential feedstock for your process, like CO2 feedstock? So, by in in our case, the CO2 comes from <clears throat> from uh, or so. What the well, let, let me start there. So if you look at our CO2 source, it's a wastewater treatment plant. They collect basically biomass, which comes from us, right, from food, um, and they treat the wastewater, produce sludge. And this sludge is basically a waste stream, which is then uh, digested to give biogas. This biogas is then split into methane and CO2, and we take the CO2. And this CO2 comes originally from our food. Um, and this food originally took up the CO2 from the atmosphere. And for this reason, it's, uh, it's a biogenic CO2. So by emitting it, we kind of uh, close the circle and the CO2 molecule itself is carbon neutral. Of course, there are emissions associated by bringing this, the molecule through the circle. So it's, um, it's actually not carbon neutral, but by fixing it, we basically get a negative entrance in the, in the registry. Got it. Um, and, and you, um, 
could notionally use CO2 from point source carbon capture that's not biogenic, but that would not be carbon removal. And you could also notionally use um, CO2 from direct air capture, which would be carbon removal. Is that correct? Have you thought about either of those things? Exactly, that's correct. And so today we, um, we use biogenic CO2 because this enables the business case for storing CO2 permanently. In the end, the aim is to generate climate impact through storing C2 permanently. And since we need to scale, we need to find a business case, we start with that. But what we believe is that uh, in a few years, maybe it's five, 10, maybe 15 years, there's going to be a compliance market where you have to, uh, where the price level is sufficiently high that uh, fixing fossil emissions um, also eats a business case and then we would switch. Got it. Um, and just one quick follow up on that. Uh, and carbon accounting, and again, I appreciate all of the detailed life cycle analysis and explanation of your methodology um, on, in this, on this front. But with, with CO2 storage and concrete, the question often comes up, who gets the credit? So in your case, you're merchandising the credit. And does that mean you're purchasing the CO2 from the source of biogenic CO2? Because both sides can't get the credit. I mean, the capture and the storage can't get the credit. So in this case, the storage is merchandising the credit and you, are you purchasing the CO2 from your source? Exactly, that's a very good question. So we are purchasing the CO2, but I think the key step is that we actually have contracts with the CO2 source, with the transport company, with the storage, well, sorry, with the recycler where the CO2 is stored, which basically um, tell that we our rights regarding credit end up at Neustart. Yeah. And so there is no, I would say, double claiming. Yeah. I think that's really important. And it's something that is very fuzzy, I think, with other folks in the space. So I'm glad to see your clarity there. Um, or occasionally, sometimes fuzzy. Um, in terms of the, uh, so you you mentioned that, that the theoretical maximum CO2 storage per ton of concrete is 50 to 60 kilograms via your process. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So that's like a, you know, five or five percent rate are is your process potentially complementary with other means of co2 storage in concrete for example injecting co2 in the concrete and if so um what is the sort of if you package all of the different methods you could use together what is a theoretical maximum of co2 storage per ton of concrete mm -hmm. if you are if if in fact you can put some of these things together yeah let, let me touch or let me answer this question from a different perspective so well, what's the potential? And the potential is basically limited by the amount of cement produced globally, by the globally produced process emissions which stem from the fact that we take limestone and uh, split the CO2 and release it. And currently these emissions are at 1.5 gigatons per year. Now the cement, which is used today, uh, ends up as demolishing concrete in 60 to 80 years. So if we go 60 to 80 years back, we are just after the Second World War, and after that, the concrete uh, production volumes were about tenfolding within 25 years. And then they were flat in Europe, but in other areas of the globe that, uh, that changed quite a bit. So this storage potential, which comes from cult signing, limestone, um, can be used. And this can be used by either injecting CO2 in concrete, by carbonating, demolishing concrete, uh, I would say that, <clears throat> but this is the, the limited potential. What, what we have seen is that, so I would say that there is, there, there is one approach where C2 is injected into fresh concrete. You have to consider that the, what, what, what is mentioned there is that they inject, I think, I don't know, 300 grams per um, cubic meter of concrete, something like that, and maybe 150 stored. So this, reduces our potential, but not by much, because we talk here about like orders of magnitude higher. If you do precast concrete, so basically if you cast structures in an autoclave and you use CO2 to cure the structures, of course you cannot, uh, but what you cannot do is you cannot, um, uh, you cannot store more CO2 afterwards because this potential is already used. But there comes the question where there's a removal technology because you produce a product, right? Your product 
is uh, basically this concrete structure and your process there is that you produce cement where you emit first and then you capture the CO2 and store a part of it again. So I would say there um, it's, a bit, it's a bit questionable because usually you associate the emissions or these emissions are counted to the product. In our case, the primary product is the concrete structure, which is reaches end of life. So it has then as it enters the second life, it enters with zero emissions. Um, got it. Thank you. And so what I'm hearing is that that sometimes people will talk about carbon negative concrete and um that that's not possible with storage alone. You would also need to capture the emissions at the source of calcination, or you would need to use some sort of alternative process that does not have a CO2 process emission. Is that correct? So, um, I mean, carbon negative concrete is possible if you do point source capture. Uh, so capture all the fuel and process related emissions at the cement plant. And then let's say you store additional biogenic CO2 in your, in your, in your concrete after the end of life. But I think we are quite far away from that. Got it. Okay. Um, and then one last question, because we have a bunch of audience questions that are, that are, that are going to be, that are good. They're, they're, they're um, pretty specific questions, which is great. So thank you for those. Um, you mentioned uh, that you're looking beyond the borders of Switzerland. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, we actually had a question, a private question in the chat, which I'll share with you afterwards about potential expansion in North America and a source of CO2 in North America. Like, how are you thinking about your geographic expansion over what time period? And are there particular markets that are of interest, for example, because of new policies that have been implemented in the US potentially? So, um, so basically, I mean, this year is already over, right? So next year, it's uh, clearly a focus on Europe. But uh, so our plan is to enter the, uh, the North American market in 2024. And uh, what, what's important is that emulsion concrete is only available in developed economies, which use concrete already since 60 to 80 years in large amounts. So it's basically developed economies, which are our target markets. In the upcoming years. Got it. Um, and as we discussed before, we turned on, opened up the Zoom. I mean, 2024 is, is very soon. So like what, what kind of, from a business development perspective, when you're looking at a new market, what are some of the key priorities? Like what do you have to put together to be able to enter a new market? So what I mean, what, 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 what we have to put together is that we need to start uh, I would say we need to open a cluster in, I would say, a first urban area where we have a few CO2 sources, a few recyclers. And from there, we usually start expansion. I um, would say um, this is basically how we work. We start with business development. As soon as the market is developed, basically, I think from a regulatory perspective, all is clear, but also that the business uh, case is clear in the country, then we start the expansion in the whole country. Got it. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for answering a few of these questions. And um, I think Mega is going to hop on now to start um, sharing some of the audience questions and see if we can talk about those. Yeah. Um, so we had a few questions, I guess, on the sort of chemistry and technical side, which I'll start with. Um, so the first one is, how does the process perform when you have contaminants or any other non-CO2 constituents? Uh, for example, can you do this with raw biogas or conditioned biogas? So that that's a good question. So um, would say the only contaminant which, or you, you need a contaminant which can undergo a reaction with uh, with the cement phase in order to to have an effect. And the only one I know is SOX. So there you would basically form gypsum. Um, so we would basically I would say poison your potential. It would reduce your potential. So, but would say this process is very robust against uh, against contaminants. And what you have to consider is that this is more a theoretical exercise because mostly you uh, you don't want to transport a concrete aggregate um, because it's very heavy. So you have to uh, transport at least I would say yeah m much more concrete aggregate than CO2. So what you always do you liquefy. And by liquefying, you're already, uh, you automatically purify the CO2. So you have barely any contaminants in the CO2. 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, another person asked, what happens to the methane in the process? Um, so if you so if you upgrade the biogas, you get basically a methane stream which goes to the grid and it's used as a replacement for natural gas. And the CO2 itself does only contain PPMs of methane. So actually not much. And uh, this, these PPMs of methane, they are usually vented. But alternatively, they can also be recycled to the biogas upgrading process. At our recycling plant, I mean, almost no methane ends up because this is basically separated once again by liquefying the CO2. Okay, got it. And then does the potential for CDR increase if you think of other raw materials beyond demolished concrete? Um, and they suggested, for example, other industrial wastes like fly ash, bauxite residue, steel, slag, etc. In principle, yes. Um, demolishing concrete is just by far the biggest, uh, I would say, pool for storing concrete and it's, uh, it's most abundant. Uh, but these streams can also be used. However, one has to consider to um, has to consider the current use case of this material. So, if this material is, for instance, today used to replace clinker, and you start carbonating it, uh, you, you do something very bad because you increase emissions outside of your boundary system, so the clinker emissions, and then you possibly uh, increase the real economy emissions instead of decreasing it. Okay, yeah, makes sense. And then this one, I think it's just a clarification in one of the slides that uh, maybe was hard to read, um, but they asked on the carbon dioxide uptake and performance uh, graph, what was the purity and form of carbon dioxide injected? And what was the time frame? Um, they had a trouble reading the x-axis. I don't know if it's easy to just talk through or uh, what's the yeah, easiest way. So the, uh, the purity was almost 100%, ambient pressure probably 15 or 20 degrees, injection period was maybe, I don't know, 60 or 80 minutes. Um, I think so it's, it's a typical shape, right? Um, so that you have this very steep uptake and then it, it decreases and the process time is basically an optimization problem be, be, between the reactor volume and the, the, the total of amount of C2 you want to sequester. Well, thanks. Okay. Um, moving on, I guess, past the technical side. Um, well, one, uh, someone asked about MRV. So are you doing the MRV yourself to measure the volume of CO2 removed? Um, do you work with third parties? How do you approach that? Uh, we work with gold standard. So basically, this works in the following way that uh, we, we have a, a methodology in place. And then we basically, um, uh, we basically, uh, let's say apply these projects under gold standard and we have to measure process data according to this methodology and submit a monitoring report. And gold standard sends, uh, I would say, um, people over who actually check whether everything is done correctly. And then on an annual basis, they check our, our uh, the, these reports and then they issue credits uh, in their registry. So we, we don't do that ourselves. Okay, got it. Um, thinking, I guess, a bit more about the economic side. So someone asked what kind of business model makes sense for this? Um, does the investment required for the options you presented lend itself to a local concrete recycler? And uh, curious what the payback period would look like, for example, it looks like it works from what you've shared, but any details would be interesting. Yeah, so, um, I mean, so the, the business or how, how it works today is that we sell these plants to concrete cyclists and it's, I would say, relatively low cost to what they, uh, what they usually invest. But in the future, the business model also can look like that, that we actually rent out these plants to concrete recyclers and we have, let's say, an, an operational uh, model where they, for instance, pay, uh, where, yeah, we basically, let's say, um, um, get the credits and we would we would also pay them a bit for for operating uh, the plant so i would say there are various various opportunities and we are going to uh, check all of them uh, to uh, to roll out as fast as uh, possible um, the payback period is uh, depending very much on the it's depending very much on i would say the 
uh, the, the local environment, but it's somewhere between um, uh, three and 10 years. Okay, got it. And then beyond uh, that, um, are there any sort of com uh, government, uh, you know, support or regulations that help uh, companies like yours, either in Switzerland or the EU? Um, and what more do you think is needed to help this kind of uh, model scale up? So right now, there are no governmental regulations, which help us a lot, um, I would say that's today, right? But what happens is that there is the Euro European emission trading scheme and under this trading scheme, uh, C2 storage in Dimension concrete is also considered as permanent. So potentially that's a market for selling very high uh, or for let's say get, we are selling very high volumes of storage um, to these systems in Switzerland. There's another system which is currently established with also a price which can actually cover the costs. Of, of such value chain. So I would say right now the support is not, there's not a lot of support really from a voluntary action, but uh, but we see on the horizon that many many things are happening, which, uh, which make it more and more attractive. Great, and then I guess on another uh, similar front, um, I think noticing that Swissbury was uh, on the sort of data source for some of your slides. Uh, could you talk a bit about how the financial players like Swissbury and others are engaging with CDR? Yeah, of course. So what, what we have what we have seen three years ago that there was, I would say, or three years ago, there was almost no market for, uh, for high quality carbon dioxide removals. And then uh, then would say uh, Swissbury paved the ground with, um, uh, with actually negotiating a first agreement with uh, Climeworks, and what they what was most important for them is actually that they want to have high quality removals. So quality, when we talk about removals, is mostly associated to permanence, so that uh, the CO two remains permanently stored, such that they don't need to cover the the same removal every ten or twenty years. And what we have seen since then is that. Oh, your sound seems to have cut out. Can you, no. can you hear me again? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, we're good. No, okay. perfect. So. So what, what, what these financial players figure out is that their scope one emissions, they're rather small. Um, small, let's say, compared to their revenues. And, and so many of them committed actually to, uh, to help this industry, industry to grow by committing uh, to long-term offtake agreements. And I mean, um, I would say there are various out there and, uh, and this is actually the, the voluntary carbon market, which which is the game changer for this industry. Great, um, I'm gonna go do one last one before I hand it back to Toby. Um, in terms of the future, can you just talk a little bit about what scaling up is gonna look like both, I guess, operationally, um, in terms of what price per ton looks like and anything else you think is relevant? Yes, so, so what, what I mentioned is that uh, in 2030, we want to remove 1 million tons of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. And in terms of scale, this means that we're going to have overall about, let's say, 3,000 plants in operation globally. And that's, I would say, a, a rough number, right? So it can be maybe a bit more, a bit less, but that's uh, the order of magnitude we are talking about. And 3,000 plants, I would say, seems to be a lot if you look at data industries. I mean, they install. For instance, if you look at elevators, they install 50,000 plants per year, single company. So this is, I would say it's in the, it, it's, it's, I would say physical and doable. Um, and uh, regarding, regarding cost, so what we can see, say is that our value chain is competitive with CCS and geological storage at large scale. Perfect. Um, thanks so much, Johannes. This has been amazing. And uh, I'll give us back to Toby to close things out. Fantastic. Um, thanks so much.
Those were great questions. Thank you, um, Mega, and thank you to the audience for um, for submitting those. Um, and Johannes, that was really um, an excellent presentation. And again, really appreciate all the techno-economic detail you shared. Um, and it's very exciting, the scale that you're already achieving with uh, upwards of, I guess, 40,000 tons of, of sales um, where you are now, according to CDR, FYI, and lots, lots more to come, I guess. Um, so congratulations and thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot. I am going to share my screen really quick and um, go through a couple other things that we have upcoming here at Open Air. Um, so thank you, Johannes. Um, very cool uh, workshop webinar next Thursday, I think, the 8th, um, launching uh, CDR policy mobilization in France. Um, uh, we'll put a link in the chat. Um, Chris or Mega, if you could find that link and put it in the chat, that would be fantastic because I think I forgot to do that. Um, but um, that's coming up and you can sign up um, and uh, and that will be a great program. We've got some really great um, uh, French-based uh, carbon removal companies and experts and investors on the, on the panel. Um, and then in terms of this is CDR, uh, we do have a couple of other open air events next week. So we're not having a, this is CDR, but on the 13th, which is two weeks from today, we have another uh, very cool um, uh, C carbon CO2 storage via mineralization company that recently launched based in Scandinavia called Pebble. Um, so please uh, check that one out. And then we just booked uh, Brilliant Planet for December 20th, which will be the last this is CDR of the year. And Brilliant Planet is a very exciting um, company that is is growing algae in the desert and then um, sequestering it for for um, long duration CO2 storage and uh, Raphael Jovin, who is the founder will be with us and so that's another great one um, and then we'll be announcing a 2023 initial schedule um, sometime in the coming weeks so um, lots coming up and uh, thank you for being with us today thank you again to Johannes um, and everyone be well and I uh, hope to see you in two weeks time uh, for Pebble um, have a good one thanks again.